evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to this grant, and I'm thrilled tonight to have such a timely and a subject that is of utmost importance. Um, and we have, I'm Nancy Bass Wyden for a little bit of introduction. I'm the owner of the Span Bookstore, and for a little bit of history, the Span was, was founded by my grandfather 83 years ago in an area that was called Book Oil. It was located along Fourth Avenue. Um, that used to have 48 bookstores, and now we're the sole survivor of, um, of all the bookstores, and I'm trying to carry the fortunes into the next, into the future. So, thank you all for, for being here. I am uh, so pleased to welcome the celebrated economic policymaker and political affairs Robert Reich here tonight to discuss his new book, After Shock: um, The Next Economy in America's Future. Right to Secretary of Labor under Bill Clinton and former economic advisor to President-elect Obama. He argues that without a return to the basic bargain, that workers are also consumers, the after-stop shock of the Great Recession includes a long-term high employment rate and political backlash. Um, Reich is a professor of, of public policy at the Goldman School of Public Policy at <laughs> the University of California, Berkeley. He served in three national administrations, written 12 books, including The Work of Nations, a lot of the books we have here, um, and, and the bestseller, Super Capitalism. Articles have appeared all over The New Yorker, Atlanta, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. He's also co-founding editor of the American Prospect magazine and provides weekly commentaries on public radio's marketplace. He blogs at robertreich.org. So he is all over the place. And as a matter of full disclosure, I want to say that um, we are, um, my husband and I, Senator Wyden, are big fans, and Ron considers him one of Robert's friends. So, and we're, so thank you, thank you for being here. So just as a little bit of format, um, we're gonna, uh, Robert's going to talk for a while, and then we're going to open up the mic to your questions. And um, we're gonna um, we're gonna have a pass along a roving mic, and if you don't mind, just standing up because we have a nice sized crowd here, so that everybody can see um, who's asking the question and can hear it properly. So afterwards, um, Robert's gonna stick around and, and autograph copies of his book for you, which you can purchase downstairs on your way out of, of the store. So please join me in welcoming Robert Reich to the Strand. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, and uh, thank you especially, uh, Nancy, before you go, <laughs> thank, you, thank you for the strand. I mean, independent bookstores like this are key. <laughs> go take care of your twin three-year-olds. They think she's standing. Um, it's lovely to see all of you tonight. Uh, you'll be pleasantly pleased to know that, as we learned a couple of days ago, I don't know how many of you saw the good news, uh, the Great Recession uh, <laughs> uh, officially uh, ended in uh, uh, June of 09. Isn't that great news? Don't you feel great about that? Don't you feel good? How many of you feel better knowing that the Great Recession ended? Uh, well, it, it, that announcement uh, is a pretty good... Uh, indication of the gap between economic theory and where most people actually live. Uh, the Great Recession lives on and has mowed down almost everything in its trap. Uh, three years ago, I was five for ten. <laughs> <laughs> this book uh, is really my attempt to understand what this is all about, and also where we're going, and the choices ahead, political and economic choices, uh, because you can't really take uh, politics out of economics or economics completely out of politics. Uh, and I contend that we are living through an aftershock of something that is not just a garden variety recession. This is not like previous recessions. At least it's not like any previous recession in most living memory. Uh, this recession has to do with uh, the final stage, in a way, of a certain plateau that the working class and middle class America have found themselves on. For three decades, middle 
class incomes, median incomes in the United States, have basically adjusted for inflation, gone nowhere. Uh, the typical worker today, male worker, is earning today, adjusted for inflation, less than he learned, uh, earned three decades ago. And the typical American family, in terms of keeping up their purchasing power, has had to uh, basically do three things, in, almost in series. Uh, first of all, women went into paid work in huge numbers, beginning in the late 70s. I wish I could tell you that women went into paid work in this country mainly because of the wonderful professional opportunities open to women. But that is not why most women went into paid work. They went into paid work mostly to prop up family incomes that were dropping because male incomes were dropping. And secondly, when that was over, I mean, basically you can do that only so much. In the late 60s and 70s, uh, about 24%, 25% of women with young children were in the paid workforce. Now, it's upwards of 65%. And there's a limit to how many women with young children, given how we allocate, unfortunately, how we allocate gender roles in our society, uh, can do that. Secondly, when that coping mechanism wore out, and or was exhausted, the second coping mechanism, everybody working longer hours. And we found that by the end of the 1990s, even before the 2000-2001 recession, Everybody, everybody was working in, a, in America much longer than ever before. 350 hours, the typical worker, more than even the European worker or the typical industrious uh, Japanese worker. In fact, if you have two members of a household, two parents usually, who are both working, they have to use shifts uh, to take care of kids. I have a, I, I came up years ago with a sociological term, I think I coined it, D-I-N-S, DINS. These couples, double income, no sex. <laughs> and then, finally, we got to exhausting that mechanism, because there are only so many hours people can put in, and you get to the third coping mechanism that also becomes exhausted, and that is going deeper into debt. And you can do that almost painlessly if the value of your home continues to go up. Because you can get home equity loans and you can refinance your home. And between about 2002 and 2007, Americans pulled out of their homes about $2.3 trillion through refinancing and also home equity loans. It's not money. And again, it seemed pretty painless as long as the, uh, the housing prices were going up and as long as banks were willing to do it. And banks were only too happy to do it because by the middle of the 2000s, uh, 2000s in fact earlier than that, Alan Greenspan and the Fed lowered interest rates to almost zero and didn't supervise bank lending. And so it was easy. It was all very easy until it all came to an end because none of that is sustainable. Now, the common view is the Great Recession occurred because Wall Street went bonkers. And Wall Street did go bonkers. And Wall Street, I'm not exonerating Wall Street at all. Wall Street was behaving irresponsible. It's a gigantic casino. It did go bonkers. But peel back that layer of the onion, and you see something that is more important in terms of where we're going now. And that more important reality is that although the American economy grew between 1980 and 2007. The American economy grew, but the benefits of that growth went only to a very small sliver of people at the top. Now let me give you a statistic. I know it's late. I'm reading your eyes. Some of you are glazing already. But I want to give you one economic statistic. It's very important. If you go back to the late 1970s, the top 1% of Americans by income took home about 9% of total income in all of the United States. After that point, income started to get more and more and more concentrated, so that by 2007, the last day for which we have good data, the top 1% was taking home 23.5% of total income. Now, when the top takes home such a huge percentage of total income, the middle, the vast majority of Americans in the middle, don't have the purchasing power they need to buy all of the things that can be produced in the United States at near full employment. 
unless they go deeper and deeper into debt, which again, as we just said, was, is not a sustainable strategy. Uh, as I was going through this, through the data, as I was preparing this book, uh, it struck me that there must be parallels in American history. I mean, I, I was interested in the Great Depression, and I came across some writings by a man named Mariner Eccles. Anybody remember Mariner? You're, you're blogging Mariner Eccles. Well, you know who Mariner Eccles was? Yeah. Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board under uh, Roosevelt, and uh, earlier? An A. You get an A. <laughs> uh, and he, he became chairman of the Fed in, 19, in, in uh, 1933, and was chairman all the way through uh, almost 1948. The Fed building in Washington, you know, this white mausoleum-like structure, uh, the most powerful group of economic policymakers in the world sits in there and meets, as they did earlier this week, is called the Eccles Building. It's named after Mariner Eccles. Uh, and I remember uh, when, when I started getting into Mariner Eccles and thinking about Mariner Eccles and reading his writings, I actually talked to a friend who works in the Fed, and uh, I said, what's the name of your building? And she said, well, I think it's the uh, Eccles Building. Do you know who it's named after? She had no idea. A lot of people did not remember him, but here's why you want to remember him. Uh, well, he's an interesting character. He was one of 21 children, uh, born uh, in Utah, a Mormon family. Uh, his father came over from Scotland. Uh, he became one of the richest people in America, the richest man west of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, he owned a huge number of banks. We're talking about the 1920s, uh, really 1915 to uh, right through the time he became the Fed chair. Uh, he was an extraordinary character and an extraordinary industrialist. Uh, but here's what's interesting about him. Uh, in 1933, before Franklin D. Roosevelt took over, in fact, it was January 33, Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, took the reins of the presidency in March. That's when they did it in those days. A Mariner Eccles was called to testify before Congress about what should be done. We, you know, it's the Great Depression. It was an absolute economic crisis. And Mariner Eccles' testimony is amazing. I don't have it in the book. But someday, maybe I'll write a, a biography of Mariner Eccles. <laughs> uh, but the testimony he gave to Congress foreshadowed everything that the New Deal did. And this is before Roosevelt even had decided what the New Deal was going to do. Roosevelt came into the presidency as a deficit hawk. He was just like Herbert Hoover. They all wanted to balance the deficit. They wanted to balance the budget. That's what they all wanted to do. They didn't know about Keynesian economics because Keynes himself had not yet written his famous treatise on Keynesian economics. That came later. Mariner Eccles were the first to say government has got to get in there and prime the pump if there's inadequate demand. He was the first to come in there and say, we've got to have social safety nets. He was the first to come in there and say, there has to be a national minimum wage. He was the first to come in and say, there's got to be a 40-hour work week with time and a half for overtime. It was Mariner Eccles. Now, what's more interesting about him for the purpose of this book and my research is that he also wrote about the origins of the Great Depression. He was not satisfied that anybody really understood it. And here he was, one of the most wealthy, famous industrialists in America, and he did his own research. He was at the Fed, he did the research, and here's what he came up with. He said that the inequality that had occurred by the 1920s, by the end of the 20s, was the direct lineal descendant of the Great Depression. What happened was, according to Eccles, so much money accumulated at the top, the middle class did not have enough purchasing power to turn around and buy the goods and services that the economy was capable of producing without going deeper and deeper and deeper into debt. Meanwhile, people at the top had so much money that what they did is instead of create jobs, they turned around and speculated on the same set of assets. By bidding up the price of land, the price of certain commodities like gold, bidding up all sorts of specialized things and stocks, shares of stock, and everything came tumbling down. You cannot, said Mariner Eccles, sustain that kind of an economy in which people are going deeper and deeper into debt, average Americans, and people at the top are speculating like mad. Both of those.